mic working? All right. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk about some work that my research group is doing. So I want to start off with a series of uh, caveats here. Actually, no, I want to start off by thanking the organizers of this event. I know that it's kind of small and scrappy this year, but I think it's really cool that this is going on. I think these guys and women did a great job of pulling this together on a pretty short timeline. And I anticipate this being bigger and better in the future. So are you guys having fun? How many people are having fun? How many people are doing cool hacks, building cool things? How many people are building something on mobile? All right, so um, my, uh, let me, now let me get to the disclaimer. So unfortunately, this is not a tech talk. I was just peeking into the other room, 113A, and this guy's got code up on the board, and he's talking about what this function. And honestly, it looked really confusing. I was like, if I can't walk into the room and figure out what your framework does, I don't know if I want to use it. But anyway, um, I'm not going to do that. There's going to be no or very little code that's part of this talk. And the code that is part of this talk doesn't work yet. So um, this is not, you know, I'm not going to teach you something that's going to be useful to you in the next 24 hours. This is a research talk about stuff that we're doing that might work someday in the future. OK? Um, this also is not about a Google product, service, framework, or whatever. Um, although we just got some support from Google to work on this project, so maybe someday in the not so distant future, Google will actually support something like this. Um, this is a talk about the future. It's also designed to be interactive. So if you guys have questions or are angry about something, uh, please stop me. And, or if you would prefer that I talk about something else, like graduate school or how to use the Google search engine better or something like that that you guys might care about, uh, please just stop me. Um, I will talk, point out there's a talk about entrepreneurship in the other room. Uh, so if you're less interested in the future and more interested in making piles of money somehow, um, that guy in there is really tan and he has a really nice tie. So those are both signs of a successful entrepreneur. I have a t-shirt on. and. Uh, so anyway, you can, you can use that as your way to judge our respective fates. Um, on the other hand, how many of you guys have heard about mobile apps before? How many of you guys are building a mobile app as part of this hackathon? OK. Um, and the, I'm sure the reason you're doing this is, is somewhat related to this idea that mobile apps are going to be your ticket to the big time. Somehow, by writing a mobile app, you're going to make a lot of money I was peeking my head into another talk the other day, and there was this guy who had a slide up. Actually, he was sp the other thing about this guy was he was speaking really loud. I don't know if I'm speaking that loud, but I could hear him all the way down the hall right, as I was about to leave the building. I don't think I'm speaking that loud. Um, but he was, he was talking. He had this slide up, and he was saying, this is what a billion dollars looks like. And it was this huge, was anyone, was, was anyone at that talk? I don't know what was going on, but you heard this guy screaming about what a billion dollars looked like, so I had to peek my head in. And he had this picture of this you know, cube of money, right? And it was supposed to be a billion dollars. But, but, but then it got, it got me thinking, because I'm an analytical person, like maybe you are, maybe you're already thinking this, doesn't it matter what size bill you're using, right? Was that a billion dollars in ones? Or was that a billion dollars in like $1,000 bills, which might look smaller, right? So anyway, but this was a big cube of money, right? Like, and you can imagine having that at your house and being worried about having a big cube of money like that. But maybe it was all one. So if someone grabbed someone and ran off, they'd be like, too bad, you only got 100 bucks. Um, OK, so those look like fairly big bills, so this guy's pretty happy. Um, but my goal today, I always tell my students when you give a talk, you have to have a goal in mind. You should have an objective. What are you trying to do other than fill up the time so you can stop talking? Um, my goal today is to, first of all, to convince you that you are not capable of writing mobile apps. You are not going to be this guy with the dollar bills. You're more likely in your present state with the present tools that you have available to you to be like this sad cardboard thing that has been left out in the rain. I don't know what that is or why. Uh, it's out in the rain. It's clearly not cardboard because it would probably be disintegrated by now, but it doesn't look happy. Um, and however, I'm going to lead, I'm going to, you know, this is like sort of like the rising action part of the talk where you get sad and confused. 
You're not sure exactly what's going to happen to you. And then I'm going to provide you a pathway to the future. I'm going to give you a way out of this predicament that I'm going to show you that you are actually in, whether you want to be or not. Um, and that way out is this new system that we've created, which is awesome. Um, and I'll describe that system to you and all of its awesome features. All right. So to some degree, while the title of my talk might actually be Building Less Certain Mobile Apps, the actual title of my talk, the objectives of my talk, are to make you less certain that you're capable of writing mobile apps and more certain that you need my help to do this. Right? And of course, this is, again, I, I do not have a tan or a purple tie yet, right? but I do have a money-making plan, which is that I'm going to cash in on your future success. Right? So if that's you, see, there's me, right in the middle of that <laughs> pile of money that you've somehow made. Okay? So this is my plan. Um, okay, so let's talk about the App Store. So 15 years ago, it was really not possible or extremely difficult for a single programmer to quickly deploy software across the entire world. You couldn't wake up in the morning, you know, at your normal early hour of like 10.45, right? I mean, you're out of bed before 11, so that's a win. Um, you know, brew some coffee, go over to Starbucks, pay $5 for your latte, and then around lunchtime decide, hey, I want to write software and distribute it to a billion people today. And then you couldn't do that by the time you usually wrap up for the day, like around 3.30 or 4, you know, because that's when you know, Sports Center comes on again, or whatever. Um, so you couldn't do this 15 years ago, right? And I'm going to argue that was good, right? This was a good thing. So these software marketplaces that we all know and love, like the Google Play Store, they have exposed people all over the world to code written by people that wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do this 15 years ago. 15 years ago, there were processes for distributing software that you had to follow. You couldn't just throw something onto the App Store and hope that people would download it. And now you can do that. Um, why is this a problem? Right? So here is a, here is a graph showing the distribution of uh, programming talent, programming skill. Okay? So I want everyone to perform this little mental exercise. Look at this graph and decide where you are on this graph, right? Are you better than the average programmer or worse than the average programmer? So the problem is, if you actually, if you actually got, if you guys actually told us what is in your heart of hearts, this is how the distribution would look, right? Everybody out there, how many times have you ever met someone who writes software who says, I'm a pretty crappy programmer, right? <laughs> I actually think I'm a terrible programmer. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I continue to write code even though it's terrible. Uh, most of us think, well, OK, I might not be an awesome programmer. I not, might not be one of these guys who's like super, super productive, but I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, there's some terrible programmers out there. They're not me, right? Of course, this is what the graph actually looks like, right? And it's a sad fact that 50% of the programmers out there are actually worse than the other 50%, right? I can say this with utmost certainty. Um, when I went to, I graduated from Harvard, and there was a joke there that every year Harvard's goal was to get more students into the top half of the class, right? That was sort of the goal behind grade inflation. Somehow it, it didn't seem to work out that way. So um, now let's say that you are different, right? Let's say that you are half, again, so half the people in this room, give or take, are above average programmers, and the other half of you, I should say, half of the room, Half of us are above average programmers, and half of you are below average programmers. Um, so even if you're in that above average group, it's a good group to be in, I know, um, it's extremely difficult to anticipate what goes on after your software is deployed. And it's become more and more difficult as we've made it easier for you to deploy software. So now that you can easily write an app and push it out on the App Store, and have thousands of people using it tonight, and tens of thousands next week, and a million in a month, it's extremely hard for you to anticipate everything that can happen out there. Okay? Um, and so I, I kind of think this is like the Pandora's box of software uh, deployment. Right? I'm going to allow you to program 1 billion devices, but there's also this caveat. Right? The ways that we've allowed you to deploy software, deploy software onto some of the most complex and challenging devices out there. 
right? Mobile smartphones are super exciting as a development platform. This is how we are bringing the web and computing to people. The people that we're bringing online on the internet are using these mobile devices. They don't have desktops, they don't have laptops. Everybody with a desktop or laptop is already on the internet. The people that are new, the way that we're expanding the internet, all on mobile devices. So this is incredibly cool, incredibly exciting, but also incredibly difficult as a programming environment. Okay, so now let me uh, try to convince you that if this is how you feel about, I love using the laser pointer to poke this person in the nose. Um, if that's how you feel, if you feel confident about your ability to write mobile apps, you should not. You should feel uncertainty and despair, okay? Um, and I'm gonna do this using only 16 bullet points, okay? So, okay, ready, here we go. Here are the things that you're not thinking about that you should be thinking about that can affect how your apps perform in the wild. How about mobility? Mobility is the characteristic of these devices. It means that things change really quickly. One minute I'm standing inside this room and I've got a great Wi-Fi connection and then I make the mistake of wandering outside, which is a completely reasonable and normal thing to do during three months of the year in Buffalo. Um, and then suddenly your app, network connection is ruined, right? Um, same for the accuracy of location services. So maybe it's a trade-off. I was in here and you had no idea where I was because UB hasn't put its access points on these mapping services yet, but then I walk outside and suddenly GPS comes up and suddenly you know where I am. What other devices or resources do I have access to? This changes as I move from network to network. I might be on a local network at home where I have other computers nearby that I can contact, I can use them to offload computation to do other interesting things, and suddenly again I walk outside, I'm on a mobile data network and it's, this is over. Those are not publicly accessible endpoints. How about on a geographic scale, mobility, differences in the networks that we've deployed across the world? The networks that we have here are different in quality and speed in the aggregate as networks that you find in developing countries, and sadly, because you guys happen to live in the United States, as really awesome networks that you find in other developed countries that have put up much more kick-ass mobile data networks than we have. Um, what about the power grid? Mobile devices, these are energy constrained. You guys are used to always having an outlet nearby, unless you're in an airport, of course, because airports have all been built with no outlets in them. But normally, you guys have outlets everywhere. You go overseas, you may not be able to find an outlet. If you find an outlet, there may be no power coming to the outlet for a period of time. So particularly the new people that we're bringing online onto the internet suffer from a lot more va variability when it comes to power availability than we do. What about other devices? This affects how people use their smartphones. You guys have desktops and laptops. The new people that are coming online, the new customers that we're bringing onto the internet just so they can download your apps, a lot of them don't. So my advisor was recently overseas in Indonesia. He works at Google now. And what he discovered is everybody there has a smartphone. That smartphone has a feature that is probably somewhat unusual in the States, which is it, they are all out of storage capacity. Why are they out of storage capacity? Because these people don't have a laptop with a terabyte of storage that they can offload their photos to. This is the only device they have. And so once they've taken photos of everybody in the family, there's no storage left. And this affects the ability of the device to install software updates and things like this. Um, energy constraints. So here's another thing that fluctuates throughout the day. How much energy is left in the battery? What, how does that affect whether or not the user is actually going to be able to make it to the point they want to be able to get to without their uh, device running out of energy. Um, how much does, long does this device last? There's huge differences between devices when it comes to processing power, when it comes to energy consumption, when it comes to storage capacity, network usage, all of these features. So the hardware has a big impact on things. How, and, and even if you can know these things, how much should your app actually use in certain states? Is, your app, is it okay if your app uses up 50% of the user's battery? Maybe if your app is awesome and the user loves it. But maybe if your app is, hasn't been used in weeks or months, it shouldn't be using any energy at all. Maybe at that point, any energy consumption is too much. So users are a great source of variation, sadly. Right? Um, how often does a user use the app? Um, what percentage of their total usage time does this represent? So this could be a very popular app to them, or it could be an app that they've actually forgotten that they installed, or it might be an app that they only get out once in a while to do one very specific thing. 
So this affects how your app should behave. How important is your app to the user? Uh, what other apps do they use and interact with? An app that's on a device with only four other apps is probably can behave a little bit differently than if you're on a device that has 50 other apps. How often do users charge? Even when power is available, you have users that charge all the time, in the car, at their desks, and then you have people who only seem to plug in their phone when that little warning comes on, right? Um, and there are, the, both of those people exist, sadly, despite my attempts to move people from the latter category to the former category. Um, do users even know how to connect their device to a Wi-Fi network? So we run a smartphone testbed here, and one thing that we've always been surprised at is we have users that never use Wi-Fi. They don't seem to be able to figure out how to connect to the UB Secure network, right? Which, admittedly, is harder than it should be, but also there are very, very good guides available for how to do this. Um, do users have a metered or unmetered data plan? This affects how much network you use and how that network consumption affects the user. So, oh, I'm not even done. I'm not even counting my own bullet points, right? Devices, does this device have a particular feature? And what are the power performance trade-offs inherent to the device? So this is, if you combine all these things together, there are decisions that your app has to make that are very, very hard to make confidently. And so you should be uncertain. And my advice is, don't try to solve this problem yourself. And I'll show you how you're going to try to do that in a minute. And then I'll show you a different way that we have uh, to give you guys new tools to build more adaptive apps that can respond to some of these challenges. OK. But this is sort of the mantra of the rest of the talk, right? Which is that, in general, programmers are dumb, right? Uh, especially and in including you. And, this, and, and, and it's not really even fair to say you're dumb. You guys are smart people. But you're not going to be able to figure out how to adapt all that variation that I just showed you. You just can't do it. Partly, you don't live in those other countries, you don't experience those networks, you don't use those devices. How many people here have a device that they purchased in the last year or two? A smartphone. Okay? You guys have no experience of what it's like to use most of the devices that people out there in the real world actually use, right? Your devices are fast and they've got components that are really energy efficient and they've got lots of storage. Try going and finding a Nexus One, right? and see if your app still runs on that device. Right? There are something like 20,000 different devices supported by Android at this point, which is a pretty stunning number. And as the Android ecosystem continues to age, that number goes up. OK, so let's look at how you might try to do this today. So let's say you're doing something simple in your app. You have some sort of background task. Maybe you're checking for some sort of update from a, a web endpoint. And you're trying to figure out, how often should I check? Uh, if I check uh, frequently, it means that the app has fresher information and I might be able to deliver notifications more quickly. If I check infrequently, it means that the app might have stale data, but it also reduces the amount of energy consumed by the app and the network usage. Okay? So now, hopefully, I've got you thinking about all the different things that could affect this otherwise very simple decision. And you might end up thinking, I don't know what the right rate is to use at this point. OK? So here are some of your options today. This is the most common thing that we've seen people do, which is they guess. Right? How many people have written code like this, where you've had to pick some sort of timer interval, and you think, oh, I don't know, five minutes is a nice number? Right? You know, I like multiples of two, 32 seconds. Kind of weird, but whatever, it's multiple of two. It makes me happy because I'm a computer scientist. So, you know, 1,024, I don't know how long that is, but whatever, again, another multiple of two. So, yeah, I mean, you, you come up with little, you know, little guesses, right? Um, so I'll just say, okay, every two minutes I'm going to check for updates. That seems reasonable. Maybe that's a little fast. Maybe I would say 10, right? Okay, so that's one way you can do, right? But here's the thing. If you were not sure about how to pick this value, there's a probability that you're wrong, that in certain cases this is too fast, and also in certain cases that this rate is too slow. So the other thing you could do is, you know, let's say your app is out there and you're bored and all the money's rolling in, and you know, in between all the fancy dinners that you're eating and the trips to Tahiti and stuff like that, you know, you want to make a couple updates to your app. So you might sit down and think, okay, well, you know, originally I used this static timer interval and I don't know, I can do better now, now that I'm a billionaire. 
now that I hit this huge block of money at my house, um, I can actually do better than this. So let me, let me write up some code that does this. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do, right? You know, clearly I care about energy consumption, and there's a few comments on the Play Store, despite the fact that my app has like a 4.8 rating. There's a couple users that are complaining because they say it drains their battery. So here's what I'll do. I'll set some sort of threshold, and I'll say if the battery level is below that threshold, then I'm going to slow down the rate at which I check for updates. Otherwise, I'll actually, you know, run it at even a faster rate. So this seems completely reasonable. Has anybody actually written code like this before? Yeah, most people just guess. Yi Hong, you're not, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, most people don't even bother to do this, right? Because maybe, again, once the billions start rolling in, you just forget about it. But here's a way to, here's an attempt at adaptation. And this seems completely reasonable, right? Okay, so what's wrong with this? Well, there's a lot of things that are wrong with this, right? I just told you that these devices have different battery capacities. They consume energy differently. Your app may be the user's favorite app or an app that the user rarely uses. And so can you really pick a single threshold here? Maybe for some users, you should never check for updates, or you should check for updates once an hour. And for other users, you should always be using the fast rate because they, um, they always use the app. It's the favorite app. It's open all the time, OK? And then what threshold is that going to be? How are you going to choose this? I deliberately left this off the slide because who knows? 20%, 10%, 50%? Really depends on how energy constrained this particular user is. So, you know, do these branches even do anything, right? Depending on what kind of network you're using, it may be that the cost to perform this check is actually really low. And you may not need to care. It may work to just set one, one static thing and just move on, right? If most of the time there aren't any updates, What's the overhead of just sending a few packets over the network? It's not that bad, right? Or you might find out that when I'm on 3G, this is really critical, whereas when I'm on a 4G or an LTE network, it doesn't matter as much. And so you want to know not only is there a difference, but how much of a difference is there? If there's a big difference, then I might want to slow down more aggressively. If there's a small difference, I might not even bother, OK? And by the time we get done sort of starting to try to answer some of these other questions, you're, you've gone back to doing what I told you not to do, which is to be a superhero, right? And most of us, when we try to be superheroes, end up like this guy, right, who's like an overweight superhero with a duffel bag, right? Uh, and most of us just aren't cut out to do this, OK? So what's the root of the problem here? The root of the problem is that, you know, you are being forced, at the time that you develop your code, to collapse uncertainty you have about how the code should work into the certain code that you have to deploy in the place. Right? Even if you try to do this case-based adaptation that I just, uh, you know, just destroyed right here, that's still completely deterministic. And there's no way for this code to adapt itself at runtime. So our solution is simple. Right? Stop trying to be so certain. Right? You know, this is, a, this is a message of hope. Don't program this way. When you are uncertain, find a way to tell the system. And you guys don't have that way yet, but let me show you how to do it. So here's what you would do today. You try to do some sort of adaptation that has to be baked into your code right up front. And um, it is the, the, how well this works is completely dependent on a number of different things that you don't know yet. So let me show you another way to write this code, um, like this. So this is the system that we're building, is designed to support entirely this syntax. So you'll see the difference here, right? What this does, right, is rather than forcing you to write deterministic code and collapse uncertainty in your system, it allows you to identify parts of your system where there is flexibility. What you are telling our system is that it is OK to do the thing either the one way or the other way. That's all right. That's OK with me. I don't know which one is best. And so rather than trying to figure it out when I wrote the code, I just decided I would tell you about it and let you figure it out. So. Now, what this requires now is an entire system for getting from here 
to the ability to make this choice at runtime. So the goal is when I hit the top of this new code block, the system should know what to do. It needs to do either the first thing or the second thing, and it should be able to figure out which one is better. So we do this in three, and there's three parts to the system. As any good system, there must be three parts, right? If you have a system with two parts or four parts, you know, either add a part or combine two parts together, right? Because you'll find a three-part system is much more satisfying. Um, so the first part is you express uncertainty or flexibility. It's another way of thinking about this when you write your code. And we give you a new language tool for doing this. The second thing is, the second step is we do some form of testing. Because we, the system, our system doesn't know anything other than the fact that there is some flexibility here that I could potentially use to adapt the system later. So what I need to learn, what the system needs to learn, is all those things that might matter to how this decision is made. Right? All those things that we discussed before, how do they impact the performance of the different options that you've provided? And finally, our goal is to get to the point where we can build some sort of decision logic that allows me to make this decision accurately at runtime. So remember, the system can't do both things. It has to do one, or you know, one out of the n that you've provided. And so figuring out which one to do is the end goal. OK, the goal is to be certain at runtime. Let me pause here and ask if there are any questions about this. OK. Um, so let me show you some of this, just to give you a flavor of the syntax here. So here's an example of using a maybe block statement to express uncertainty or flexibility in code, code blocks. Right? So this syntax is familiar to you if you've used a, you know, a conditional statement before, except for the fact that there's no condition. Because by, you know, by definition, you are not providing a way to make this decision, just an indication that there is flexibility here that could potentially be useful. OK, uh, we have a label. That's part of the syntax that identifies the statement, and it's used uh, when you use other API calls uh, that are part of our system. Um, and then you provide multiple alternatives. We also provide a keyword that allows you to use this as part of assignment. So on some level, this is sort of just, as they say, syntactic sugar. But it's nice um, that the first statement says that the perf string can take on three different values, uh, low, medium, or high. The second statement says the timer variable can take on values between 1 and 60. So this is a way. And again, you could write this using a maybe uh, block syntax, but it would be kind of ugly and, and verbose. So this is a little more compact. Um, OK. So the other thing you have to clearly have to be able to do here is to tell the system what happened and whether or not it was good or not. There is a notion of goodness that's built into the system. There is algorithm one or algorithm two is better on this device with this pattern of inputs produced by this user, given this relationship between CPU and memory speed, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But there has to be some way of measuring this. right? You have to be able to tell the system algorithm one was better. Or here's a score for algorithm one. So what we do is we provide a score API. The score API allows you to programmatically associate a score with a labeled maybe statement. And this should say algorithm, not label. Sorry, that's a bug in the slide. Here what I'm doing is I'm telling the system what I care about is the runtime of these two algorithms. I don't know which one is better, but I can tell you that here is the thing that I care about by using this API call. As you might guess, I can also do this automatically. So for un, if, you don't, if you're lazy, like most programmers are, and you don't want to actually do this, we can infer certain things about the flexibility that you've provided um, that are common. So one common thing would be runtime. How long did it take to execute? Another common thing could be energy consumption on mobile devices. But here's sort of, even if you hadn't provided this, here's uh, the equivalent of what's happening. I'm measuring something about the alternative, and I'm associating the, the score with the label. So this is a measure of goodness. Um, all right, so the, the other thing, the other part of the maybe API is a log command. 
So our system will automatically uh, record a lot of different information that could be potentially helpful or potentially useful when trying to figure out how to make this decision. Things like, what kind of network am I on? How much battery is left? Um, what other apps are running? Information about the device that doesn't change very often? You know, things like this. But if you have some sort of specific information that we wouldn't be able to normally um, normally infer that you think might have an impact on how well these algorithms perform, you can tell us. So here, again, same thing. This should say algorithm, not label. Um, what you're doing is you're saying, I think that it's possible that the performance of these two algorithms depends on the length of their inputs. And so I'm going to tell you that so that when you do some machine learning later, this can be a part of the inputs to your machine learning algorithm. Because if you didn't, maybe you wouldn't be able to figure out how to choose these things correctly. OK. One way that I like to think about this is this syntax allows you to separate your app into two parts. So rather than having to build a single app that runs the same everywhere, what our syntax allows you to do is produce a portion of the app that you now write that does run the same everywhere. This is sort of standard stuff that's required for correctness. And then there's the part of the app that is tailored to me, to a specific user. By creating flexibility, you allow this division to happen. So are, if there are decisions in your app that are required for correctness, they have to go in the part of the app that everybody gets. The, I, the idea behind this is not to allow you to write buggy code. It's to allow you to expose flexibility so that I can take a portion of the app and customize it very closely to each user. Um, OK, so let's move on to the next step, which is testing. So once I've expressed the flexibility in my app, the next thing I'm going to do is perform some kind of testing. Now, here's one easy kind of testing for you guys to think about, which is post-deployment split testing. So you send out your app to 1,000 users. 500 of them run algorithm one, 500 of them run algorithm two, or maybe they bounce back and forth between those uh, in, over some period of time. I record information about what happened, um, and I use that uh, as inputs to the next step of the process. In certain cases, we're also looking at ways to run this beforehand. So if I can uh, pull out good automated testing suites for your app, and run them in an environment that has realistic performance, I might be able to get a sense, a little bit of a hint, about what works and what doesn't, even without having to bother real users. Because clearly this is a bit intrusive. It means that there's some portion of your user population that actually might end up running code that doesn't work very well for them. But it's required in order to, so uh, we can learn about what works well for everybody. So, you know, here's my little, uh, a graphic that says what I just said, OK? Um, so yeah, so we're looking into ways to do this through simulation, which is better because we don't have to bother real users, um, various forms of monkey testing um, on real devices that, again, don't have to bother real users, although you have to bother the poor monkeys. Um, and so, so here's a fun idea that we want to try out, which is this idea of simultaneous split testing. So I told you that uh, that phone can't do two things at the same time. It can't actually choose two of the alternatives, but maybe it can. With enough compiler support, we might be able to execute all of the different alternatives one by one uh, and pick one of them. The reason to do this is simply because it means that all of those different statements were executed in roughly the same environment. So as long as the network conditions aren't changing extremely rapidly, I might be able to run all of them under essentially identical conditions, which gives me a really nice sort of apples to apples comparison between the different pieces of flexibility that you've exposed. OK. Finally, I want to be able to remember, the goal here is to be able to make a decision at runtime. I hit the top of this maybe statement, I want to know what to do. And depending on the type of flexibility that you've exposed and how it varies uh, based on all these conditions, there's a couple of different ways that this can work out. Um, the, the simplest one is it doesn't matter. So you may have uh, exposed a difference between two algorithms or between two strategies that essentially is irrelevant. Um, 
they just end up producing identical performance. Um, another simple uh, outcome is that there is a single winner. So we find out that it turns out that, you know, and you didn't know this, so you found out something new, but one alternative that you provided just outperforms everything else everywhere that we can test it. So this is essentially what's, where current sort of split testing approaches uh, stop, right? So up to here, what we're doing is split testing, which some of you guys may be familiar with. And I like to think of this as split testing with better syntax, because I really like the syntax that we have. I think it's very elegant. Um, so at this point, depending on you know, how you feel, you may choose to just remove this particular bit of uncertainty or flexibility from your code. You may find out, oh man, that thing I tried just didn't work. I'll just get rid of it. I'm a little embarrassed by it. I don't want anyone to see that crappy algorithm I tried. I'll just leave that out because I don't anticipate it'll ever be useful. But you know, it's also worth pointing out that as devices change, if there are small differences between things, you might want to leave that in there just in case we find out a year later when we test it again that, oh, OK, this new device with this particular you know, uh, set of components actually does better with this flexibility that's still in there. Right? Um, OK, so now, now is where it gets fun. Because that's sort of, again, that's, that's where split testing gets you. Right? Split testing leaves you in this position where you have to pick one, one thing to run everywhere. And of course, the nice thing about split testing is that you do only get to pick one, right? Because it's easy. So I do some testing on two different devices, and somehow I have to pick one because if I don't pick one, it becomes a lot more complicated. But it also becomes a lot more interesting. Um, so here's another pattern that the adaptation could take, which is that it might depend on things about the device or environment that don't change very quickly. So in this case, what that would mean is that if I took all of you guys in the room, about half of you would do better with one algorithm, the other half would do better with two algorithm, and that would be, and I could just tell you guys that, I could tell you the app's running on your phone that, and I'd be done. Now I need to maybe test again in a year when networks have changed or whatever, um, but, but pretty much I don't need to do any dynamic adaptation. What's best for you now is also best for you now, five minutes from now and an hour from now. Um, and this is probably because the best alternative depends on something that doesn't change very quickly. Right? Like, for example, the model of your device. A year later, you buy a new device, I have to start over, but as long as you continue to use the same device, I'm good. Right? Um, in this case, what we can do is we can do the learning on the back end, and we can propagate decisions to devices and just let them, let them hold on to those decisions forever. The second case, which is really interesting, is when the adaptation actually depends on time. So even for a single user, the best choice depends on something about the environment that changes quickly. In that case, I actually need to be able to propagate strategies for adaptation to the device. So your device actually, when it hits the top of that statement, has to do a little bit of extra work to figure out, um, you know, okay, well, am I, am I on a slow network or a fast network? How does that intersect with other things that I need to compute and make the decision? But essentially what I'm doing is propagating custom decision-making logic for each statement that's based on learned performance attributes for your device. Finally, if everything, if all of this fails, I can always fall back to doing something extremely simple, which is every time somebody installs the app, I do a little bit of testing. And I probably even if I can make good decisions about what to do, I'm still going to introduce a little bit of uncertainty in the system so that I continue to learn over time. Right? Um, but if worse comes to worse, it may be that there is no algorithm that can take the attributes from your device and predict what to do. And in that case, I can either do one of two things. I, if it's a static adaptation case, I can just test both and see which performs better. If it's a dynamic adaptation case, I may be able to automatically create a strategy just for you. Right, which is kind of cool. Um, and finally, and, and I really hate this option, but it's in here for correctness, or sort of completeness, I can also just make you make the decision. Right? I have two alternatives, you know, I don't know, and maybe this is because they have trade-offs. Maybe this alternative always performs better, but also consumes a lot more energy. So what I might do is put it in the settings, automatically promote it into the settings dialog for your app, and let you make the decision. The nice thing about this is that I can tell you exactly what impact that setting has on the app. 
So right now, when you choose settings in the app, it's like, well, I want to, I, I want to, you know, on my music player, it might be like, well, I want to sync music on 3G, on mobile data networks, and on Wi-Fi. But I don't know when I choose that setting how that's going to impact me, right? How much data, extra data usage is that going to cause, right? So this we can do because we've done this testing and we know more about it. Okay, and you know, obviously as things change over time, uh, this is not the end of the road. We get into a loop here where we're testing and resolving uncertainty and building new strategies dynamically as things change. All right, so currently uh, we're working on a Java-based prototype for, that's targeted at Android apps because we think Android's a fun place to do this given that there's a lot of uncertainty in mobile app development. Um, we are, uh, if you want to talk to the person who's building this primarily, it's Yi Hong back there, raise your hand. Yeah, so Yi Hong is the one who's, and this is a little out of date actually, Yi Hong should get this part of the talk. Um, so, let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm almost done. So I'm gonna skip through the results because uh, they're not super interesting. Um, and I wanna talk about a couple other things. So, um, so we're also, other than, than mobile apps, we're also looking at other places where we can expose uncertainty and where it could be useful. So one place that I'm excited about are libraries that run everywhere. So SQLite is an example of something that has become a really um, critical part of a lot of standalone apps. Right? There are a lot of apps that use SQLite. Most Android apps use SQLite for a variety of, of reasons. It's used for ORM, it's used for simple object persistence. Um, in a lot of cases, it's used in ways that it really kind of shouldn't be. It's basically, a, you know, we've seen a lot of apps that use it essentially as a key value store. There are better ways to do that, but hey, um, you know, everybody who writes Android apparently knows SQL. Um, so that's what they want to do. Um, and in this case, the uncertainty comes from just the environment I'm in, right? An embedded device with, you know, 4K of memory is a very different beast than uh, uh, sort of a slice in one of Google's data centers that might have an enormous amount of memory, right, and a really fast disk. So here the uncertainty comes from the fact that these ubiquitous libraries end up in lots of different places, right? Um, harnessing parallel development. So here's a way to write better apps. Farm out parts of the app that seem like they're difficult or complicated, and have three people on your team write that function, right? Three people write it, it passes all the unit tests, and how do I choose it? Which one to use? Don't. Just wrap them all in maybe statements, push it out, and we can figure out what to do for you. Right? So this is a nice way of you know, allowing teams produ to produce robust code for mobile and other types of uncertain environments. Um, encouraging more brave development, right? So you know, let's imagine you're hacking on Linux. Right? And you find some old crufty code that has a Linus Torvalds comment on it. Right? Are you going to rip into that and you know, uh, remove it and put in something better? I don't know. I wouldn't. Right? But, I, but here's, here's what you can do. Right? So here's a little bit of a friendlier way to contribute to projects rather than saying, yeah, Linus, that code sucks. Um, it's terrible. Um, just say, OK, Linus, like, we'll, we'll run your code if it's the best. Right? Otherwise, we'll run my code. Right? And let the system figure this out on its own. Um, again, it's possible that your code is terrible. Right? Um, but it's also possible that Linus wrote that code in 1982 when he was really tired. Uh, and it's still probably pretty awesome, but anyway. Um, so there's another thing. The other thing that, that my group is looking at that I hope that like, there are people who are involved in this community that will uh, get behind is this idea of, of expressing uncertainty in the classroom. So um, I'm, next year I'm teaching a new course on how the internet works. And when you take a class at university, essentially what happens is I show up and I say, hi, my name's Jeff, and I am here to tell you about all this stuff. And unfortunately, and you know, it depends on who you're learning from, uh, you may be more or less unfortunate, but unfortunately, I'm all you've got, right? So if I don't understand something, then you're going to learn my misunderstanding of that thing, right? Um, alternatively, if I don't explain the thing in the best way, maybe I'm not the expert in the area, maybe I know something about the mobile web, but I mainly know about it because I'm teaching a course on the internet, I've learned about a lot of this stuff. Wouldn't it be great if I could go find somebody else to help me, 
right? So this is my former advisor, Matt Welsh. Uh, he leads a group at Google that focuses on mobile web performance. So Matt knows a lot about the mobile web. Matt thinks about the mobile web all day long, um, and I don't. So maybe it would be better if Matt could explain that particular concept as part of the course. And so what we're doing now, let, but you know, let's imagine that both Matt and I have taken our stab at explaining this idea. And along comes the confused student. And I want to point something out to the women in the audience, which is, I think, alarming, which is that if you Google confused student, about 80% of the photos are female. OK? <laughs> I don't know. You guys should get on Google about that, because it's a problem. <laughs> All right? I had, to, I had to look hard to find this confused man. Um, OK, so anyway, confused uh, student um, is not sure. And, and the point is, who should get a chance to explain the mobile web to this confused student? You know, I'm teaching the course, and maybe I'm a little better at relating to students, or maybe I know a little bit about how to uh, you know, explain things in simple terms to people who are beginners. But again, my advi former advisor studies the mobile web. He thinks about it all the time. So maybe he's better. How do I know? Um, maybe if I had a lot of confused students, um, what I would be able to do is figure out that it turns out that, that some confused students do better with me explaining it to them, the ones that are wearing red and glasses, um, and the other confused students uh, do better with Matt. And of course, the nice thing about this is that if those confused students remain confused after either I or Matt explain this particular idea to them, as long as we're explaining the same idea, we still can rely on each other's explanations for backup. So if the, one of the uh, red-shirted, glasses-wearing, confused students still doesn't understand the mobile web after I explain it to them for five minutes, then I can say, hey, why don't you listen to Matt? Because Matt will explain the same idea, and there's a little bit more reinforcement. And unlike a lot of online courses, the reinforcement is done by somebody else. So rather than forcing them to say, hey, why don't you listen to me explain the same idea over and over again until you get it, you stupid dolt? Um, I can say, maybe I just don't match up with your learning style. Here's somebody else who has a different take on it, who explains it differently, uses different metaphors, has different sort of a mental structure for understanding. So we're rolling this out next year. It's going to be used in um, a first class on how the internet works in fall 2016. I'm creating sort of a library of online content for this class. Um, and I'm hoping that we can have contributions from other people in the UBCSE community and in the broader tech community. So if you think that you can explain some of these things and you want to give it a try, the videos are at most five minutes. So it's not like you have to record an hour-long lecture with PowerPoint or whatever. Um, it's just if you have a very clear way of explaining something like a web protocol, please email me and uh, we'll get you involved. And this site, internetclass.org, should go live around the end of the year. And at that point, we'll be able to solicit com contributions from other people in the tech community. Um, OK, so in summary, you know, uh, embrace uncertainty. Uh, please uh, be willing to try out our new system. This system will also go live soon at maybe.cse.buffalo.edu. Um, if you want to do something that's like split testing, but a lot more awesome and also free, um, I hope you'll think about using our tool chain. Because we will you know, have the whole thing set up where you can write this into your code, and the rest of it just sort of happens automatically. automatically. Um, finally, just a little plug for my group. If you like this kind of thinking, and you, I mean, clearly you like to hack because you're here at a hackathon, but if you also like thinking about building experimental uh, next generation computer systems, uh, you know, please consider doing a PhD. Uh, if you're an undergraduate, talk to me about other opportunities in my group. Um, I like this stuff, and I like working with students. So um, that is other, uh, is that where I ended? Yeah, that's where the projector gave out. Well, that's a good slide to finish on. So thanks, guys, for your attention, and I will take questions. Questions. It's a great question, right? So overhead of making this decision depends on the decision itself is not going to be non-zero, right? So we will definitely have to weigh that against the potential benefit, right? So if we know after testing, for example, that there's only a small difference between two choices and yet we have to run a very complicated decision-making algorithm, we might say forget it, right? Just pick one of them, doesn't matter, right? But yeah, definitely, definitely the case.
Right, so if the decision can be made in a, in a static way for your device, then we push it to your device and there's no runtime logic, right? So at that point, the overhead is basically zero. The only time there's an overhead is when there's more dynamic decision making that has to be done. In that case, we push a strategy down to your device and that has to be executed. Maybe every time the decision is made, but maybe not, right? For example, if we can figure out how you know, in more of a reactive programming model, how it changes based on its inputs, then we can figure out when it needs to be recalculated. So there's some ways to improve the performance of this, but we are, yeah, we're certainly cognizant of the fact that if there are small performance differences, the amount of machinery that's required here is probably not worth it. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Right, so yeah, so the, the testing, our, our goal is to do as little on-device testing as possible, right? Because that creates situations in which users are exposed to decisions that might not be the right one, right? So what we do is that the testing process is something that you can control through the web API once you use our tool. Um, but ideally, we can figure this out before we actually even get it out to users, right? So if we can do some simulation, or if we can do some traces that we collect from users to figure it out, then great. But, will again be like yeah, I know, yeah, the simulations aren't gonna be that accurate. So probably in most cases, we're gonna have to push it out to a, to a small group of people and run it for a short period of time. But we can also, we can also do sort of continuous testing, right? So this is common in all of these frameworks where, you know, 1% of the time when I make a particular decision, I'm gonna choose a random value, right? And what that allows the system to do is continue to generate new data about how well things perform so that I don't have to do like focus testing where I make a lot of wrong decisions all at once, right? So if I make a wrong decision every once in a while, not the end of the world, if I can learn, right? Yeah, good question. Other questions? Sorry, I've been favoring the side of the room, but there's more people over there. Uh, what is the uh, choice, uh, like, the programmer doing the background, like, selection, or uh, the user gets the option to select, depending on, like, what you gave an example, 12% 12, 12, 12 power, like, train, or, like, something like that? You mean for the, well, once it's, uh, once it's a settings? Yeah, like, uh, maybe you have the two options of giving the user the option, or you do it, the back end, like yeah, so 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 we really we really want to make these choices without punning them to users. I mean, to me, that's the ultimate last resort. I mean, apps have too many settings anyway, yeah, right? Users may not be that. Yeah, but the, again, the nice thing about it though is once it becomes a setting, we actually have a lot of information about it, right? A lot more than developers normally do, right? Because we've tested it and we understand the trade-offs on that device. So rather than saying, you know, again, if you look at the settings on your apps right now, there are settings that say this may increase energy consumption. Well, how much, right? Like if it's by 50%, then I'm probably not gonna check it. If it's by like 1%, then I might not care, right? That so- depends on uh, your previous testing and then- Yeah, exactly. So this, but this could be done in our system for every user, right? So for you, it might say this increases energy consumption by 3%. For me, it might say 30 Right, and you and I might make decision, different decisions at that point. It also point. depends on the battery. Uh, yeah, capacity of course. Well, that's the thing. It depends on the device, battery capacity. You know, for, for example, something like caching music over the network, it really depends on when I add music to my library. Right? If I add it when I'm off on an LTE network, then the energy overhead might be quite large. Right? But I know that. Right? I can know all this stuff because I've done the testing on your device and I know things about how it works. But yeah, no, I like the idea of doing the settings, but I, I don't like settings, right? I don't want more settings, I want fewer settings. Uh, but at least if we have to do settings, we can do them with a lot of extra data that is helpful to a user, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. If, if the score is something that the, that the system can compute, then that's ideal. So if it's performance related, 
if it's energy consumption and there's not much of a performance difference. Um, my group is also involved in studying like a bunch of other different aspects of these types of systems. So if I can measure, for example, the responsiveness of the UI, that I could use that as a part of the score. But there are other cases where it kind of depends on what the app ends up doing, right? So maybe your goal is to, maybe your goal is to engage users and have them spend a lot of time sort of inputting data into the app, right? So if you can measure that, you try two different layouts, right? You measure that, then that's the score for the layout, right? In that case, the score is not something that the system would have been able to compute for you, right? So ideally, you know, in the, in the type of things we think about, because my group is sort of focused on building mobile systems rather than higher level app type stuff, we think about performance, you know, energy consumption, things like that. But I think there are softer aspects of app uh, performance that you might be able to use the scoring interface to express. Right? But, there are also, but that also ends up being things that you have to measure as well. Yeah, yeah. So the the the, the trade-offs is a really good example of a place where the system uh, would would either need to do one of two things, right? Either we need to make either the trade-off creates a new decision, right? Which is, is it okay for this app to waste a lot of energy to improve its performance a little bit, right? Because for example, if I have a setting that improves performance by 10x, but only increases energy consumption by 5%, and that's a win, right? Um, whereas if I have another option that increases battery consumption by a factor of two, and only performs, produces a small change in performance, then again, so the cases where there's a real trade-off might end up being things that you either have to promote as a setting, or have, you know, a, a, a sort of system-wide setting for different apps, right? So for example, the system might be able to figure out, OK, these are the apps that you use the most often. For those apps, it's OK to trade off energy for performance. Whereas if I have an app that you haven't used in a month, it's just running in the background, that app can never trade off energy for performance. Right? It always has to use the option that reduces energy consumption, even if it would increase performance, because who cares about performance? Right? Like you don't use it. so. right? So yeah, the trade-off case is interesting, right? That's something we need to continue to study. Uh, we need to see how often that actually happens. Right? These are very good questions. I'm impressed. Any other questions? General life skills questions that I can fail to answer? <laughs> All right, thanks. You guys have been a great audience. So uh, enjoy the rest of the hackathon. I wish you the best of luck in creating awesome stuff.